Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Desk University. Uh, my name is John Skippers. I am your guest host today, filling in for Timon. So um, we are super excited to have a uh, great presentation from uh, Tade Hakopian from HMC Architects. He is a design technology manager. And um, this is one of those presentations where if you're a, a Dynamo or Grasshopper user like I am, and you're really looking to get to the next level or see what that next level looks like, um, this is exactly what uh, he's going to be talking about. So uh, this is going to be a really great session for you um, kind of beginners and, and pros alike. A um, couple things, uh, check out our website, Your Desk University for um, the future sessions. We have next week uh, surrogate modeling for real-time performance analysis. And then the following week after that, uh, build an infrastructure for environmental simulation. So you can find both of these on yourdeskuniversity.com. And if you're not a mem uh, member of our Slack group, uh, check that out. Um, we'll po post a link to that as well. Uh, it's where there's going to be a lot of really great discussion. So. With that said, I'm going to pass this off to uh, to Tade and welcome to the show. And we're we're super excited to have you. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. This is great to be here. Uh, so yeah, my presentation is going to be about taking your coding to the next level. Uh, this is going to be something for the, all those people who have been having a lot of fun with computational design and those uh, you know whether it's Grasshopper, uh, Dynamo, or anything else like that. It's visual scripting kind of built into the software you're already using. Basically, how can I continue this? I'm kind of interested in this stuff. I'm interested in coding. So this will kind of give you like this starter pack, a starter guide of where to navigate through this. And there'll be all the main steps. I'm not going to go into exhaustive detail how you set up every little thing. There's, there's, depending on what you want to do and how you want to pursue it, there could be many different variations. So I'll give you the general purpose kind of concepts. And if there's questions along the way, we'll ad address them. I want to make sure people get a, a sense of what's possible here. And so if it ends up being like this kind of specific thing or it's outside the scope which well you can message me maybe on, on linkedin or something but it'd be outside the scope of this presentation again high level kind of intro to the developer setup and what it takes to get there to level you up so that you feel comfortable moving into that kind of more text coding uh, outside of the visual scripting so let's get started a little bit about me uh as uh, john mentioned i am a design technologist developer background in architecture with experience in bim vdc architectural design projects Big and small, everything in between, lots of data. I've, I've done lots of course authoring for BIM, uh, Dynamo, and coding content over the years. It's a big uh, interest of mine. And I work with the Digital Practice Group at HMC. You can have our link down here. And we're a group that's trying to uh, find ways to innovate and accelerate the way we work in design. Uh, HMC Architects is a California based company. So we have this great group of people who um, support the designers and make it so makes it possible for them to do all sorts of the um, digital transformation um, throughout the company, which is always a challenge. Anybody who's tried that knows it's a challenge. So uh, if you want to learn more, you can check out our website and our projects, and you might see some projects later on today. So a uh, quick question here. Uh, can you become a coder? People are like, you know, what does it take? Well, do you like problem solving? Are you interested in visual scripting? Do you find yourself reading through posts to solve problems? Do you like longer term projects with iterative updates? Does that sound something appealing to you? Um, and, you can code. I think that's kind of the starting point is you have the curiosity to get started in this field. Uh, it doesn't, you have to be an expert enough. It just takes time to kind of acclimate, but as long as you have that interest, no big deal. And these are important steps before you do anything. Get out of your comfort zone. Uh, always start learn and try things out. There's no real clean way of learning this stuff, uh, especially these days. Maybe 20 years ago, it was a lot more uh, straightforward by the numbers. Now it's kind of like, you know, figure it out as you go. So these steps ahead will kind of help you cut down those uh, the time. So again, what interests you, which problems do you want to solve, what's the best way to deliver your solutions? And one of the ways uh, to deal with that is just have a good developer setup. And here's my kind of path to this. I, you know, I used to just learn how to use formulas and BIM and design modeling. That's kind of got me oriented to the idea you can use like technology to solve problems. And like a couple of years ago, I started using visual scripting and Dynamo. That, that got introduced me to computational thinking. Then I started Coding with Python and Dynamo, and I hope whether you're using Python and Grasshopper, Python and Dynamo, whatever, that's a basic type of text editor. And that got me introduced to the idea of how you would even use a text editor. So it's a nice kind of smooth transition there. Then I started using Python scripts and automation for the API in Revit. Then I'm like, you know what? I want to blow out the world of BIM, just going to the web development world, uh, please learn that because web makes everything smoother and more frictionless. So that's the kind of thing I want to do with uh, 
moving forward and, you know, create custom apps integrations that are much easier to do than to code something into the Reddit platform or the Rhino platform or any of these other platforms. So that's what I've been working on. So it's been a pretty steady progression. I am no expert at this stuff, but I, I've been learning it over the years and it's been easier as you go. And so most coding is pretty straightforward for those who are interested in having a similar progression. And a good chunk of your time is understanding the right problem to solve and figure it out correctly. But before you get started, you need to get an editor. And so this is something that you may not be introduced to because maybe nobody in your entire company or anybody you know has done this kind of stuff before. But basically, an editor is just uh, how coding works. It's like it's basically coding text. Uh, you type it out. It's just formatted in a certain language like Java or C plus or Python or something like that. So you need to know how to, first of all, write the code and use the right editor. So uh, if you don't know that stuff, this may seem a little foreign to you, because you can still use these techniques to get started. And you could type all this stuff out as a text code in Notepad, but that sucks because it's just a text editor. And there's nothing else to it. There's no other feature to it. So you want to use something a little more profound and useful uh, beyond what the you know text editors of Python, Grasshopper, and Notepad are. You want This is where we're getting into the meat of it. Um, and what you want is get an editor. Uh, this sounds easier. It is pretty easy. It used to be kind of uh, you know, not so clear. But there's a lot of editors out there. There's Vim, Spline Text, Atom, Nat, Brackets. There's a lot of text editors, like hundreds actually. Um, so they're all pretty much free. And what you need them to, is to help you code. Otherwise, you're going to hate your life. It's going to be very challenging to catch all the errors and do things without having these editors. And the one I use is VS Code. VS Code is uh, pretty easy to uh, work with. It's becoming the industry standard, just about everybody in every field of coding tends to like using it. It's very lightweight, but you can also extend it. Oh, there we go. Uh, it had a little GIF here. So everybody likes to have VS Code, in it. and it's a Microsoft product, so it integrates with other Microsoft products kind of nicely. So if you have no idea and like you're not attached to anything, I say start with VS Code. It's very, very, very user-friendly. Some of the other ones are not. Uh, it just depends on what you started with. So, and also, just have a nice folder location, your C drive, to work with the code. Don't toss it on your desktop. Don't toss it in some obscure folder. Just keep it as close to C as you can because that just makes your editors uh, easy to work with. So install the editor, find one, install it, and have a nice folder with all your stuff. So in this case, I have a coding folder with Python and that Python folder, I have some code. Very simple. Uh, I, have a link, I have links to articles here as we go. So you can learn more. I, I can't spend, this be a whole topic of discussion all on its own, some of these. So just keep your code organized in a nice folder. And uh, from there, also just have an editor in your way to go. And uh, what you want to use with the editor that people might not know, I didn't know this right away, was uh, something like VS Code especially. It has a lot of extension support. So if all you're going to use is VS Code, and it's, it's cross-platform. You can use it on Mac OS, Windows, um, Linux computers. Uh, so you can install this stuff on the fly. So you can actually install Python, JavaScript, Java, even other APIs in there as you go. It's a simple install. If you ever did any kind of install in Dynamo or Package Manager or something like that, it's that simple. Very easy, and it does a lot of great um, services there. So we'll talk about a few of those. Uh, and one of them is, um, these, these are the main ones people tend to recommend. Uh, these are extensions you can install in your editor to help you work. So the editor helps you catch, it helps you format the code, it helps you uh, edit the code, it's a debugger tool, it does all the stuff. You, also, you can also get help working with it. So um, one is linters. Linters in general help you catch errors. VS Code has a few built in, but there's some more advanced ones. It's prettier to format your uh, JavaScript code. There's Emmet to format your HTML. There's Jupyter Notebooks to format your code snippets and data frames. We'll talk about these a little bit. Uh, with Emmet, it's really awesome. If you're doing any kind of web development, just by everything that's moving into web development these days, so that's why I bring it up, um, is you just put you put in these little like things like in this case the guy's writing in uh, you know exclamation point enter and he creates your whole uh, doc type HTML which saves you a ton of time. Uh, I this is the kind of thing once I discovered I'm like well I can't live without this now because it's so much so convenient. So I recommend checking this out if you guys want to install again VS Code. You go to the install and there's a package manager there basically extensions manager and you just, you just type it in the search bar and type this in. I, I provide links for each of these as we go. And there are whole, docu whole documentations on each of these. So this is my recommendations. There's Prettier, which helps format your JavaScript code. So that it looks nicer and easier to read. You don't have to do this manually or find your own methods. Uh, and yeah, it's great for finding errors. Like these are the kind of things that makes you enjoy coding more, these kind of extensions. Prettier is very, very popular. So is Emmet. So again, left the link at the bottom here. 
you want these kind of things to help you read and organize your code as you go. There's also linters, there's ESLint to help you review code errors. So they says, hey, you can see an example. Oh, here's why your error is here. You use the uh, name instead of the event, for example. We'll just tell you. It's, it's kind of like AI to help you filter through. So it's like, why is this happening? I know this happens a lot as you code is that you're trying to, you think you did everything perfect and you miss a semicolon or use the wrong function or something like that, you use the wrong name and you're just losing your mind. But if you have a nice linter built in, and again, uh, most uh, uh, editor tools have these, it'll help you read through the messages and say, hey, like, you know, maybe this is your problem and you can check it out as a cop, of course. And so it helps you figure out why it's not working the way you want to, even if it's written correctly. So sometimes it, you write correctly with the wrong stuff. So it's like, it's like, I can't work this out and I'll give you suggestions. Maybe you're trying to do this instead. Because if the debugger will tell you this doesn't work, or you're like, well, I wrote this code correctly. It's not as though you misspelled something. You just used the wrong method or call. These kind of things are great. Saves you a ton of time. You might have to go through 10 different linters. So this is just one ES lint. There's a lot of them out there. Again, my, these are just high level examples. If you actually go talk to developers, they'll give you like obscure things they've used for years that works for them. So these, this is not the gospel, it's just the starting point. And then this great thing is VS Code also supports uh, Jupyter Notebooks. This used to be a separate, and it still is, it's a separate system where you can log into an HTML format for your code. This is Jupyter Notebook specifically works with uh, Python code. And it's great for writing code snippets and data frames and working with data. It's actually built into uh, VS Code as well. And I think other code editors have to pick this up. Really great. Um, I like this a lot because anybody's working with data whatsoever in uh, text editing and AEC, whatever. This is a great tool to have. I'm glad it's built into the text editor since I, of the VS Code, since you don't have to jump around between this and the Jupyter Notebook HTML site. Uh, this has come out in the last year or so, so it's a great tool to just kind of type away your Jupyter Notebook stuff into, or Pandas into a Jupyter for, Notebook framework without having to jump into another coding. So I like VS Code because it consolidates a lot of the stuff in one place. Before I continue, any questions, anything anybody wants to mention? So um, one question in terms of your um, your timeline, what was the uh, most difficult jump for you uh, in that timeline that you showed earlier? Oh, sure. Uh, I'll just scroll back there. So uh, I would say something around um, between visual scripting and coding. Because anybody could just take a, a graph in any visual scripting medium and just copy it, and they might get a result, maybe not. But at least you can kind of start with them. Mm -hmm. I had no idea how coding worked in 2017. I, I was just learning. So when I said finally got into coding, that was a bit of a jump. Python and Dynamo and other uh, frameworks makes it very easy. It's a very, very readable language. So uh, that took me a minute to transition. I started in 2017 and I, I really started learning more in 2018. Mm -hmm. Once I got over that, then I was introduced to the whole world of how to use developer tools and how to get better with them, how to ask questions about this stuff. There's a huge, huge world just Python, and there's a huge world in JavaScript, and a huge world in C Sharp. So, this jump between using the, the traditional visual uh, scripting, which isn't hard, anything who's touched this can say it can, it can do a few things, and then jumping into the scripting coding within the visual scripting, uh, like the actual text coding, that was the biggest jump for me. I was really surprised that, uh, how, but I, I learned, and uh, that's where all this other stuff makes more sense. And I, I did this without any kind of CS background. I, I, I knew things about, you know, formatting data and all that, but not like CS. That was the biggest jump. But after that, I was kind of, oh, was it just kind of the like infinite like number of things you can do at that point. So that's that, that stage of text coding with Python into Dynamo was where it launched me to want to learn more. And once I got over that hump, it became much, much easier because the concepts you learn are applicable everywhere. I'm glad to hear you say that because that's probably where I am right now. So, yeah. and I suspect a lot of people are. Yeah, well, Python's a perfect place to start because it's so readable. If it was like, I, if I saw like C Sharp or Java, I probably quit just because I didn't. Unless somebody was there, to like you know, show me the ropes. Python makes it super simple because it's so simple to read, so anybody can learn that and understand the concepts and take whatever. It depends on the person. I'm glad that was a learning curve for me, and it's available in a lot of different platforms these days. It's nice. And that's where I learned all this stuff over the years. I just, you know, kind of figure out like, what do I need to learn this and that, and you just kind of learn as you go and you consolidate it. But one thing that's really great uh, it, that I recommend everybody learn that's been getting more and more popular is uh, version control. And all that is is a uh, is a source control for everybody using Revit. The best thing, and the most simple thing I'd say, it's like syncing and then rolling back your changes uh, on after a sync. 
uh, especially uh, for people who work on a big project team. So you're all asynchronously working, right? You're all like doing your own portion of the Revit project in a BIM model. And when you get to the point where you have to save, you're actually syncing to the source. You all have, the, the source can be on a network folder, it can be on the cloud. That's the master file that contains everything. And everybody has their own copy that they use locally to edit. Well, same thing with Git. Git probably got that, uh, Revit probably got that idea from Git, if anything, which is a protocol for doing the exact same thing. I have a por portion of the code, you have a portion of the code, 20 other people on the team, whatever, have a portion of the code. And there's a master code somewhere locked away, probably on the server, that we all update at different rates. So it's, it's tracking the changes, it's tracking who's doing what, so that if something goes wrong, we can, we can address that person and say, maybe you need to review this, or we review it first before committing. And uh, it's a great way to work as a team on a single uh, code. Right now, probably everybody's just doing their own thing with their own stacks of code, like on their own. But when, when you have to do anything on a regular basis to save it or with a team, it's, this is what you want to learn. It's a protocol. There's a certain number of commands. It's a very much an industry standard. And you share this code. You can, this is how you can share a code base with others on a code base. And a lot of different services support the Git protocol. So the Git protocol is a system. And then the services you might have heard of, like Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab, CircleCI are built on upon that protocol as their own services. It's like if, this, if these are the files in Git, these are the drop boxes that host the cloud services and, and the systems around it. So I uh, highly recommend picking this up as you go. You don't have to be an expert anything. Just get started. I, I started using GitHub as a PDF hosting thing just because I could. You don't have to know code to even use any of this stuff. And this is kind of the idea. You would have a, a master at, at the beginning here, and the master would be what you pull or what you branch off and work on your own stuff in red. And once you have a nice feature update, like, oh, cool, I'm, I'm ready, I'm good to go, you then uh, want to bring it back and put it into the master. So you're working on your own from the master, and you want to merge and commit to the master at the end. That's kind of what you're doing. You're working parallel to the master. And once you're done, you have a nice, good-looking set of code, and you're not going to ruin anything, you, you push. Let's say you push it anyway, and it, it ruins everything, you could always roll it back. So that's that's a general idea of a uh, Git control. And uh, I got a cheat sheet for here, the good flow, good commands, there's a whole nice cheat ship of commands here. And it's basically just working in tandem with other people. Highly recommend people to, um, uh, highly recommend people to learn this stuff. And I have some, the Git commands I use the most, act, bit, check out, branch, reset, revert, merge, rebase, pull, push, status, log. That's all in the uh, education section here. So check that out. And of course, have your own GitHub profile. Uh, this, these are my contributions. I just push things on GitHub. It's nice. It's on the cloud. It's uh, free. Yeah, unless you're doing the like, uh, enterprise stuff, it's all free. It's pretty open. And it's because GitHub is owned by Microsoft. VS Code is owned by Microsoft. It, it integrates pretty nicely. And they give you a lot of cool stuff with it. So um, create a profile. Share your code. Uh, don't be afraid. No big deal. And there's a startup link here if you want to learn more. It's nice to see your profile pop up these green squares telling you what you're doing. It's, it's a nice reinforcement mechanism to keep doing it. So I highly recommend everybody to check out that. So Git Control, Git Protocol, Git Flow, GitHub, or something else like it, like GitLab. Uh, highly recommend that. It's never too early to learn that because it's, just, it's pretty easy. You can literally save your text document files on this. Like just, you're, you're working on a report. It doesn't matter, just try something out. Uh, before I continue, any questions? Um, in terms of the uh, Git, what, in terms of learning that, uh, difficult, hard, um, something you can do in a weekend or more long-term kind of thing? You can learn good in a weekend. Yeah, uh, you don't have to be an expert. Uh, I was surprised how you, here's the thing. So you, you learn it, uh, the steps aren't hard, especially, it takes time to get used to all these commands. And not all of you that use all the time, you should just do add, commit, push, pull. Like, I, I don't use all of these most of the time, but I use them, these are the ones you probably use the most. Until you work on a project with a team, you probably could use all of them. So learning the basics is actually pretty straightforward. Nobody should be afraid of learning the basics. Very, very straightforward stuff. Uh, and then uh, learning the more advanced stuff uh, takes time. You want to work with teams. But anybody can learn this stuff. That's why I recommend just getting started with it. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, coding languages uh, to continue with. Uh, uh, this is a bigger topic. Uh, but basically, people are, uh, usually have a coding language they like. And that's fine. I, there's no real wrong answer. It could be a fanboy of any of these. Um, they're all good in their own way. There's many coding languages, depending on what you're doing, one's useful. It's usually whatever you're getting paid to do. Uh, if you're, That's kind of where people become experts at their stuff, is what you get paid full-time to do. And if you're just hobby 
pick something you like. It's not there's no wrong answer here. They're all these are all general purpose. Uh, web tools are usually with JavaScript, Windows, and .NET stuff is C sharp because that's again a Microsoft thing. And Python is great for data, but they all kind of cross over these days. They used to be kind of in their own domains. They all cross over a little bit. You can do just about a little bit each with the others. So it's kind of interesting how much the general coding languages like these have expanded. And that segues into this other topic of web development and how you can kind of level up the web development. So uh, what I recommend just kind of learning more about web development because if you're in the visual scripting world and you're trying to learn more about web development, uh, or let me rephrase that, if you're in visual scripting, you want to learn more, web development is probably the easiest way to go. Granted, you may not be using too much of what you've been doing. You can probably integrate all of your visual scripting stuff over time um, into uh, a web format. So everything's moving to the web, everything's getting cloud hosted, everything's online. So I recommend checking that out because you could do just about everything with web. You can make mobile applications, cloud services, uh, data, legacy applications. You can make desktop services. It, it's very, very, very flexible. It, these days with the modern web development, you can do just about anything. So it's like, well, if you don't know what you want to do, uh, if, you, if you're like not sure what the learning curve is, this is probably the place to start. It's, it's a constantly changing environment, but there's a lot of growth there. So I'd, I'd say it's probably worth your time to learn the web development stuff. And just to kind of skim over this is there's the, the three different domains of people's you know, coding time and web development is the front end, back end, database. And database is a little more specialty topic, but it's worth mentioning here. Uh, the front end is what you see when you enter a site. If, if you go to a website like YouTube, for example, or on YouTube, that's a, when you look at it, click on things, that's a front end. Uh, and almost all, pretty much all front ends are frameworks. Uh, JavaScript is vanilla, like just JavaScript on its own without any front end. It's called vanilla JavaScript. But just about everything has a front end, and everything you see on this is a type of front end from one service or another. And you could pick and choose, you know, React, Angular, and Vue are pretty popular, but there's no reason you shouldn't choose others. It just depends what you're learning, but you can pick the popular ones. Lots of frameworks. I'm not going to go into huge detail about like which ones to take, but be aware once you get into that developer world and you start doing your um, setup, uh, and you want, like, how do I level up from here? Uh, think about web development, think about front ends. Because that's the easiest place to start. You have to know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript first. Again, this is the hard stuff to learn, the prettier formatting, the Emmet formatting, and all that stuff. All that stuff I showed you earlier will help you. This is a separate subject, but it is worth knowing how to where you want to start. And on the back end, this and I should mention this is all JavaScript based on the most part. Front ends tend to be almost entirely JavaScript. There's not too many exceptions. On the back end, it's very diverse. You can use C sharp, PHP. Python or JavaScript itself, you can do full stack JavaScript. And this is the stuff people don't see. It's the background operations that help people, uh, help your site run. It communicates to the server and, and it automates information on the server and the back end, like a developer focused thing here. So, and each one of these is its own little thing. Uh, I can't go into all the but if you want to do more web development, beyond, you can have a super stripped down HTML looking website. But you still need some kind of back end. You don't even have to have a form uh, front end, but you still need some kind of useful back end to get going. So this is just kind of an example where you would go with all of that. And uh, it's very flexible. Your front end can be JavaScript, back end can be many different languages. They all support different things. C Sharp has Blazor these days, that kind of thing. And beyond that is, uh, oh, and I have, uh, oh, never mind. Uh, and beyond that, databases. You don't have to be an expert in databases, you just have to know what they are. Uh, you can know a little or a lot depending on what you're doing with them. So don't feel like you have to start learning about databases day one. I have a little link down here to talk about what difference between SQL and no SQL as a starting point. You're probably going to start with SQL and you can pick your animal of choice uh, here on either side. Uh, Redis, I think is an, I'm not positive. I think it's a no SQL on MongoDB. I believe it's no SQL. They're all different in their own ways. Just learn how to use them. You don't have to be an expert. Just learn how to interact with them. Um, so that's a, and you could totally just be an expert in databases, but you, these are the kind of things you want to learn more about the front end, the back end databases to get started. And the big elephant in the room, the 800 pound gorilla is JavaScript uh, node package manager. It is just like this huge set of packages to install. You're probably going to run into this all the time. And it's going to be probably either through a Windows install format and I have a link here. It, it's across everything. It works on everything imaginable, every operating system. And they have builds for every operating system. It gets updated a lot. It gets deprecated a lot, meaning the code doesn't work and you have to update it constantly. And you have to learn about this probably. In all likelihood, if you're going to do anything front end or back end, you probably have to touch the NPM. So uh, it's in big giant letters because it's such a big deal. So the more you learn, the better off you'll be with this uh, system. Uh, again, a whole topic on its own, but 
there's they kind of hold your hand when they showed you like the just like git is a separate system you have to so i should also mention git you have to install git on your computer it's called git bash you install git bash when it comes to the editors you install those when it comes to programming languages you tend to install those or, or build them into your editor when it comes to the either front end back end databases database is a little bit more unique but you have to install everything so get ready to install everything i would love to guide you through how you install everything but each one of those will be its own little uh talk and that might be a whole series of discussions of how to get started on all these things but be aware you're going to have to look at these uh, terminals a lot and type in commands and get going so don't be afraid there's lots of resources like a million people i think literally a million people have had the same experience so just get used to these you know things working and updating them and troubleshooting them that's just part of the part for course uh and uh, uh let me wrap this up then we'll have some questions I should also mention this sounds overwhelming right now, and I do want to give you my take since I spent years trying to learn this stuff. Is have a roadmap. This is a roadmap for web development. Front end, there's a back end system, but front end is like you, know, you gotta learn this stuff. And I'm still like learning more and more about this HTML, CSS, and JavaScript myself. I'm not an expert, but it doesn't mean that you have to learn, become an expert, and then move forward. You have to learn enough, become a little more knowledgeable, and then you can learn about the different breakdowns and how JavaScript and CSS works, and all these other things work. And I have a link here to roadmaps for web development, front end, back end, uh, databases, security, whatever. You want, if you were like, okay, I totally want to do web development, learn what it takes to get there so you're not overwhelmed. This, is, this helps me a lot to figure out where the beginning and end is. And this is a simplified version. It goes deeper and you may want to ask questions, ask people you know, you can ask people at your desk university or other uh, groups what it takes to get there, but it helps to kind of figure out where you're going here. And this is web development. It's a lot more outlined than it used to be. Like five years ago, people were kind of like, eh, maybe Ruby on Wheels, but now it's mostly Java based and it's easier to follow through. And I should also make a note, data engineering, this is a whole different subject. It does have a lot to do with web development in its own way, but uh, it's a different kind of uh, industry. If you ever want to do anything with normal networks, AI, learning, uh, data mining, algorithms, whatever, this is a separate thing. Data engineering is very heavy on the Python stuff, but it also integrates with other things. So uh, smaller, big scale, Jupyter Notebooks is big on this too. So this is its own little path. If you're curious, web development, it's like, I want to make a website. I want to make a web tool. That's one thing. Data mine, uh, anything with data engineering is its own little system. And then you got the uh, scripts and integrations. This is something I've been working on because it's the most practical is I just want to have one app communicate to another app and web tools are great for that. You, you could just, as long as the APIs are available, you can have different clients and resources talk to each other and this is own little roadmap here and it's a little more like bespoke because you know maybe it's whatever you want to do so there's many different paths you just have to learn as you go and and figure out what the future is and ask questions um so before i continue any questions uh anybody wants to mention uh yeah so there's some there's some chatter back and forth um a couple of comments about the uh, the github desktop app uh, oh yeah you know, ma making it very easy um, to adopt. Yeah, I, I left that out. Yeah, GitHub is desktop app. Uh, so all these commands are kind of built in. It's almost like a button interface. I highly recommend everybody check out the desktop app for GitHub. It doesn't exist in necessarily the same way for these other tools. These are like, they're all competitors, I guess you can say. GitHub has a desktop integration, so you can actually, and I use it all the time, it's great. It, like it, you, This is a basic command line. So you have to type these in, but this, the GitHub desktop is, buttons and it's a visual reference it's more like software and there's nothing wrong with using either uh, maybe when you're learning it i definitely say use a terminal command line so you can learn it you can work in many different terminals uh, as long as it's connected to your repo which is where the code lives uh, which is that folder i showed you guys earlier on c drive but that said uh yeah don't be afraid to use the desktop that's a nice tool it saves you a lot of time it visualizes and changes all the time again that could be a total discussion um, in terms of the front end um, and and back end tools, do you have um, ones that you would prefer? If you had to pick one from each, uh, what, what would that be? Front end, um, I'd say two similar ones. Uh, React is the one popular because people and React looks like. Where's my React? Either the logo changed here, I cannot find it. But um, oh, is that Adam? Is that React? No, that's. Is it that R over there on the left side? This is not it. Oh. I've, either they changed the logo or I picked, I picked the wrong, but don't worry. React is uh, uh, it's a popular one. If you looked up React, or but there's like multiple versions of React JS, React Redux, but it's very, very, very popular. Facebook developers, open source, and they can get it. these are all pretty much free. Everything open source is open source and free. 
Um, so I would recommend React is a good starting point because it's so popular. And if you're like, okay, that's cool. What else can I try? Vue.js is green B. Very user friendly. Very, it's community driven. Facebook owns React basically as like they manage it. Google owns Angular over here. They manage it, uh, but like UVS is just community. It's, it's all individuals creating to it. So I say React just because it's so common and the ideas in React are popular. The other of these frameworks kind of uh, copy them and Vue.js after that because it's just so much more straightforward. Mm -hmm. But you, you do want to learn vanilla JavaScript. Otherwise, these will make no sense to you if you don't learn the basics of JavaScript. You want to make a few vanilla JavaScript sites before you get this far. But that's why I do uh, React slash Vue.js. Those are two different frameworks. They're not going to be compatible with each other, but they, they're good starting points. On the back end, that really depends on your comfort level with different code. Uh, these are all different coding languages with their paired backends. And Django and Python has like multiple as Django, Flask, Pyramid. I would say um, if you're doing JavaScript, Node.js is great. It's kind of industry standard with JavaScript. There's others, but this is the main one. Uh, and then Python here, it, I would say um, Django is good because it's what they call batteries included. It includes a lot of stuff that it's like off the shelf. Uh, so those are the ones I recommend. If you're a PHP fanboy, Laravel is great. If you like C Sharp, try Blazor. I heard a lot of good things about Blazor. But that's what I would do is either use Django or Node.js. I'm at a point where I can uh, leave one behind the other keep, but that's how I would recommend it. Django and Python, because it's just so easy to work with, uh, that's why I recommend trying that. But you do not have to have the Python code as its own language on the back end and JavaScript front end. So you have to get used to the two different things that happens all the time. It's not like you're doing something wrong. Some people just learn JavaScript and like, okay, I'll do the front end JavaScript. I'll do the back end JavaScript, Node.js. So I'd say pick one of these two, depending on what you like. I would probably go with myself, Python, Django, just because I can use two languages at that point. I like Python just so much easier to read. It's very user friendly and I can level up two languages at once, but that's just me. So that's what I recommend to most people. And databases, uh, just pick a database. There's no real wrong answer to databases. They just all they have their own little quirks and differences, but uh, these are very, very common. I, I can't speak to why you pick one or the other. If you're just accessing a database, you have to learn how to access it. But if you're actually working on it, then you'll, you're going to care. But most people working on this stuff aren't going to actually access a create a database. That's a whole different topic, but you should learn about databases and how data works. And that's not hard. You just have to, it's a starting point, uh, but you shouldn't learn how this works uh, to make your life easier. And no package manager, of course. So you're just going to have to, you're going to run into this no matter what you do, hackathons, whatever, you will run into this. So just get used to this crazy thing here. It's not hard, it's just weird. Um, yeah. And then well, another question, this one's from um, Lisa Marie. Are there any shortcuts or habits that you notice hobby coders have um, that you were doing at first that maybe uh, we shouldn't do in the prof professional environment? Um, yeah, probably should go back up here, up here, up here. Uh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. Basically, this kind of stuff. Uh, uh, don't, uh, I, I think when I learned something the first time, just like I was talking to people, learn GitHub or Git, Git flow, uh, install Git bash, uh, install uh, all that, learn how to use it, and just learn it, L learn the commands, because you're not gonna be, an, I think probably one of the things that helped me back is I wanted to be like an expert on, what's, it's kind of like you're learning Adobe Photoshop, you're like, I should learn it, right? That, or like Revit or whatever you learn. I, I got to learn this properly, then I could use that. It makes sense when using software. This is not software. You're creating the software. It's coding. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're the developer. You're the creator. You're, you're creating stuff here. So uh, it's like you're trying to say, like, I need to be an expert at paint before I can become an artist uh, on canvas. You have to learn that as you go because you don't know what you're going to do with the paint. Right? Same with this. You have to. Uh, so don't feel like you have to um, become an expert. You're learning as you go. So one of the things I would say is, like, uh, and this holds back to this day. It's, it's challenging for me is uh, don't feel like you have to master something or get to a certain point before continuing. You're, just, you're always going to have questions. You're always going to have concerns. So I, I see a lot of uh, developers who are good at this stuff. They're just okay with the idea. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's, it gets messy. Well, you have to, what, what actually is funny, an experienced developer will just kind of put something together and say, okay, if this works, great. If not, I'll try to make it work. It looks ugly and back, like behind the scenes looks horrible. But it works. It's okay. At least I have a proof of concept here. What they call what's a real nice pro move is a minimal viable product, an MVP, which says, okay, this is not the best version of what we have here. This is not the most exquisite version of what we have here. It's fine because it works. It's viable. It's minimum viable. It works. It's a product. Let's move on. 
that's something I learned developers do. It's kind of like counterintuitive. It's like, no, don't worry about it. We're in, we're in this AEC world where if it, the stupid thing doesn't stand up on its own, you know, column, it falls down. Guess whose problem it is? It's our fault, right? When mm -hmm. with coding, it's much more forgiving, right? It's more of like an idea you're always developing. So always try to find how you can move it forward without, you know, throw it over the wall and just kind of keep moving without stressing out about it, without feeling you have to make it perfect and clean up everything. That's fine when you're learning something the first time you're trying to get the concept through. You're going to revisit this. You're going to forget things that you learned and revisit, revisit, revisit reinforce your learning. Uh, so always trying to find ways to develop something to a point where it works and um, keep it um, updated if you like it. Then don't try to forget about it. Sometimes you just do it once you move on. If you like it, keep it updated. So don't, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And the other thing I should mention too, uh, and you know, use these kind of tools to your advantage. This saves time, this is tedious. After the first time you learn this stuff, there's no real good reason to keep you know, doing it over and over again manually. It's, it's a waste of your time. That's why I say use these formatters and all that stuff. This is going to save you a ton of time solving problems and debugging and all that. And also, uh, hobbyists might not be doing this very, very basic thing, which is uh, talked about earlier. A nice structured folder, which is consistently organized. You can, it's, it's something I didn't even think about. I would just toss it somewhere and forget it existed. Find a good way to structure your folders. It will save you a ton of time. I just have a certain template for my folders. Very simple. Sometimes I have something for Python. I have something for my web projects where it's an HTML, CSS, and a JavaScript file. And at least I know that's the bare minimum I need. I just copy paste that around and make it easy. Uh, don't take this for granted. This, this is literally your code. It looks like nothing, right? This is what your code is made out of. It's going to be a series of folders with like uh, different uh, subfolders in there. So don't uh, take any of this for granted because you will regret it. You're going to forget what the folder is. You're going to forget what's in it. If you got, you're going to have a hard time. Even if you did a good flow control, uh, you're going to forget where it is. Do not take your folder uh, organization for granted. Even if, now again, if you're using Git flow or Git bash with GitHub to upload to a website that has the actual master code, don't forget where this is because wherever you started this code, you'll have to link your changes to this. Don't be sloppy about it. It's not hard to do this stuff. It's not going to be a uh, a challenging thing to learn. So find a good way to organize your code. And one of the examples I have here is just like this project work on. This is something simple for like, you know, CSS, JavaScript, and uh, images and then index HTML. Keep it, it's this simple. It's, it's like you just copy paste this stuff. There's, there's resources in each one. Just keep it that simple. And you could copy that around. Just don't be lazy about it. That's the last thing you want to be lazy about because things get lost easily. You move your stuff around by mistake. Please don't do that. There's ways you can avoid that, but um, and you can. It's it's very forgiving if you make mistakes. I'm not trying to psych you out, but a hobbyist would probably be like, ah, oh, whatever, toss it in there. That's not what you want to do when you as you get better and better. It's the, the the basic simple things are what you want to do right, and the more complex things like I need to create a product. That's forgivable. That's MVP. That's uh, uh, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, but do be, get better and better at this stuff. Very, very basic stuff here. Yeah. Can't emphasize that enough. Yeah. It's so much nicer. Yeah. Also, I have another question. I think this is a really good one. Uh, sure. Are there any um, good practices for dealing with different languages in terms of data, for example, of Japanese to English? Um, data is the nice thing about all this. All this data stuff is actually pretty easy to work with. It's either in an SQL format. Uh, which has its own structure, or no, non-SQL, which is like JSON. I'm not going to get into too much of each, but uh, data between different uh, uh, languages and frameworks is actually pretty malleable. Uh, it's it's, not, it's like kind of like you know, chunks of bite size stuff you have to absorb. It's, it's not, none of this is hard with data. And everything, the front end, the, the, vanilla, oh, the, you know, the basic code, the uh, front end, the back end, all, this, all works with data. So data is actually the easy part, which all you have to do is really um, format the data and have a good way of working with it. If, if that helps every question, basically, um, I'm not sure if I'm asking a question correctly, but uh, when it comes to data, keep it simple and know what you want because it's usually structured like, you know, let's say there's a data structure for, or not a data, that's probably the word, not the right word. Um, there's data for a city. Within the city, it'll be the city name, uh, geographic coordinates, uh, population, country, and they'll ask you like, okay, from the city database, what do you want to pull from there? And then you just have to find the right thing you want in that database. So it's, it's actually pretty simple. 
the, uh, none of this is actually, once you get the hang of it, none of this stuff is particularly hard. It's just knowing what you want and formatting it cleanly and keeping the text clean. I hope that answered at least part of the question. But it's like data and all that's um, it's a big question. Uh, but I would say learn the fundamentals. Uh, I, I, Python, to me, this is my brain. Some people love JavaScript and they're like, this is awesome. Other people love Python. Python is just easier. It looks like plain English, closest thing to plain English in, in code. And a lot of other newer programming languages are copying it. JavaScript is a little closer to Java. It's not Java based. It just has a similar name. It's a totally different language. But a lot of these other ones, they look they look more like techy, a little more cody. Mm -hmm. My brain doesn't have an easy time with that. It's like, oh, there's too much formatting. It's just me. But uh, learn the fundamentals well so that translating the, the simple part of data is easy. That, that's how I describe it. That's something I learned over a long time. But you'll, if you constantly forget how to create a function or uh, whatever, a variable, and you're like, oh, how do I do this? That's going to make the whole thing harder. So learn the fundamentals of your coding languages. And the more specific, specific, things, specific things you always look up, you don't have to be an expert in this stuff. So I hope that helps answer the question. It's probably not 100% the question. But, you know, Hit me up on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Yeah, I think both uh, in the chat now, like they're t also referencing to like multilingual data contributors. So I suppose it's more in terms of like, uh, you know, translating um, between different languages, particularly maybe ones that use um, different alphabet or different characters. Oh, like actual translation. I thought it was a Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in JavaScript and Python, these, these are all English. Yeah. So if you want, so you got no English, right? But, um, that, that's how they're written. So if you're learning these coding languages in any part of the world, they're, they're in English. Uh, but as it comes to translating from one language, let's say you're literally trying to translate. Um, I think there are some, maybe some local variations, but basically if you change the language, you change the coding language. So if it's written in English, it's going to be English. Uh, otherwise, you literally change the coding language. But um, that's how you're trying to translate stuff. The good news is uh, that's actually easy. They have a whole entire packages for all of these that can you just download them, install them, and use them as you would a Dynamo package that extends your ability to Dynamo or a Grasshopper library that extends your ability to Grasshopper. Same concept, you download them and you just call those things. It's like, okay, I want to use these, and it'll translate things to each other. Extremely useful. Uh, there's entire tutorials on that, so I'm not an expert. I haven't done it. Other people have. You'd be, that's, that's why I recommend the popular ones. They have a ton of like, open source free uh, content in there to go crazy with that can do geometry, translations, data translations, language translations. So that's a whole different topic. It, it, it's all there. You can look it up online. It, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's very, very easily attainable. Um, and we have another question about um, software or uh, particular workflows for laying out your uh, code. So like a mind map tool or something like that. And what do you right. do? What, how do you do it? That's a good one. I was going to have a whole section here about tools. And I'm like, I don't really have time for that. But uh, it, it, it varies a lot from person to person, and there's no wrong answer. They're just like, okay, let's say a, a format you like or your team likes, because at some point it'll be more of a team effort uh, as you get more advanced. Uh, and you got to figure out like what's going to help you uh, accommodate what you want to do. I like creating um, I like creating uh, flowcharts that help me out. Like, flowcharts are your friend when it comes to coding. And I, I mean, that's a flowchart. So you could figure out where am I starting, where I need to go, is there like derivatives, and where do I end? Flowchart, uh, and I don't know what they use to make this, probably just built in you know, Illustrator or something like that, but you can use Lucidchart or any other kind, lucidchart.com, lucid, hopefully that's the correct one, I'll just type in lucidchart.com, it may not be the exact website, but it's like that. That's a good one. Uh, some of them are free, some of them are, are not, but just like, okay, what am I trying to do here? What do I need to uh, create? That's a good one to kind of at least, come, sometimes you're just trying to come up with your idea. Lucidchart's a good one. To come up with like the, the flow of like I need this, that, then this, that, then this, that, and you can create the flow just like you would like a visual script graph. You know, it's the same kind of concept. Um, I like to sometimes just jot things down on paper because like sometimes when I get to the actual text coding, I get kind of frozen. I'm like, this is too specific. I would literally just write it down on paper, and from there I can say, okay, okay, that's what I want. It just gets my so like, paper's fine. You don't have to make everything digital, but if you, anything you want to document. Document it digitally uh, and make it a shareable format. I like, uh, you know, Google Drive is good for that kind of stuff. Even if it's just like, you know, spreadsheets, make it shareable, make it connected. GitHub itself has a whole suite of tools that you can use to upload the copies of your code to the, to the master repo where you can always update it later or share it with other people who can update it. Uh, put a wiki, Wikipedia little thing in there that has a, a issue tracking in there. So the more you learn about GitHub, the better, or whatever you're using, the better. 
Um, I like using um, different ways to visualize it. Just uh, there's one called uh, I think it's either Miro or Mira. It's like this poster board thing. It's it's like a pool planning kind of idea. I like using Trello to come up with ideas. Like you know, idea. You can look it up pretty quick. Idea, progress, complete, or skip. And there's like different ways to organize that. That's great. Um, and there's, you know, if you want to get more sophisticated, you want to do, get to a product or an idea that's pretty sophisticated, you can use Jira, J-I-R-A, uh, for issue tracking and bug tracking and just, you know, development process. That's a lot more, you know, in the weeds, but it's very popular in the development community. Um, and Jira can help you. And, and there's also, geez, Airtables, Notion, that there's Notion.io, Airtable forms, there's um, Jira tracking, they're, they're all good in their own ways and they all do similar things. So you have to learn those on your own, but I would say, uh, try them out. Uh, pull planning is like Trello, um, and Jira and Airtable and Notion help you manage your project with the team. So that's a whole different topic. I was going to include that in here, but I'm like, we're not going to have time, but I'm glad you brought it up, uh, because that's exactly what you would use. And it's a learning curve. And what I would recommend to anybody here who wants to learn more, just ask around, Look up YouTube videos on them. Uh, if you have friends who are interested in stuff, uh, and there's a Your Desk Slack channel we post on this chat. Uh, look in there and ask around. You, you do have to try them out. See how you like it. Give it a good shot. You know, give it a try. Don't, you can't just like take a superficial look at it. You will have no idea. Again, these are not like you're running the middle software. Just you know, work on it. This is a lot more specific. It's a lot more like you know, you control it. So I, tr I say try those out, and you might uh, like it. I'll type in, in for if you get no Notion. Airtable, Jira, uh, Trello. So try those out and look for uh, organizational tools. There's so many different combinations that you do have to kind of get a flow, but the one I tend to glide towards is simpler and what I can share with other people. Most of these have a free version of it, so you can just try it out for a while or indefinitely until you, you, know, you want to buy the more sophisticated ones. This, this, is, this is like kind of meat of your project, but until you have a project, you're not going to use them. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. But you could probably use this to, you know, do grocery shopping if you want. They're all kind of it's overkill, but it's good. Uh, you can, you can, you don't have to. Again, no, nothing I'm showing you here today it has to have you know coding, GitHub, you know, GitFlow a little bit. If it's actually command line, you don't have to be a coding expert to use it. Just try them out. Don't be afraid. Make time. Let me. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, gonna see. That's great. There, you had a, a lot of them listed there, and the the Revit public roadmap uses Trello, so that's a yes. really great example of uh, how that's being used. Exactly. There's a lot, and what I do is I just kind of like if somebody else is using it, I like the way they're showing it. Like oh, I saw, I, I saw that same roadmap on Trello with Revit, and I'm like, yeah, I think I'm gonna do it this way because I'm like, why? There was no good reason not to. There was some reason why people don't gear towards one product or another is because they don't have the license for it or they have a team that uses something else. The Microsoft Planner is part of your MS Office Suite. That's the same. It looks very similar to Trello. Now it's feature rich as Trello. Trello is nicer. Planner is as good if you're doing some basic things. It, well, it's, we already have it. Most offices have Microsoft Office and Planner is part of that suite. It's online, uh, all that jazz. So, um, and basically everybody copied Trello. Trello five years ago was kind of unique. Now everybody has a thing that looks like Trello's boards. So you know, Notion has a Trello system now too. It looks like what they call it, pull planning, Kanban board, whatever. So uh, I like that format. So sometimes you pick one over the other because the um, it's available, you already have it, or somebody on your team is using it or whatever. So be open-minded, try them out. I, it's, it ends up being more like, what, what's the format I like? And then they're, they're very flexible these days. There's, there's a ton of tools out there. I probably forgot half the ones I use. Maybe a future topic is like, hey, how do we organize projects and use these tools? I think that's something I was going to include it here, but uh, we're not bound through all this. So, yeah. And um, I guess I can skim through the rest here, guys. I'm not going to get through everything, but um, real quick, uh, problem solving is part of this. Uh, that's something that comes with experience. Try to figure out what you're learning in problem solving styles. I'm, I, I'm a little, most people here are probably a visual and touchy feely it depends. Maybe somebody just like reading text. If you, the closer you get to data and backends, the more you'll just read text. That those people who develop that stuff love text. They'll just write articles and articles of just text, no pictures, no nothing, just text. So you have to get used to different styles of documentation. Documentation is your friend. Don't waste your time trying to figure out your own or asking a thousand questions. Oftentimes, uh, documentation in whatever of those services I mentioned earlier, whether it's one of the, the frameworks or whatever, 
probably answers your question. So read documentation, be happy, comfortable with text. And, and know what your learning style is too, so you can get comfortable trying to solve answers. Some people like a nice linear progression of one, two, three, four, five things like in a row. Some people like to jump around a lot, like they'll to avoid getting bored or try to find the answer. I'm more non-linear myself, so just try to learn how you think so that if you're not like, you know, tech heavy, tech focused by nature, I wasn't in my start of this, at least you can see what your biases are, uh, what your learning styles are, what you're good at, what you're not good at. That'll, that'll help you feel more confident and address your gaps. That's something of a fundamental kind of learning style there. And I'm gonna skip these real quick. There's lots of websites to help you learn. Uh, your friend's gonna be Stack Overflow, Reddit's a good place. I have a million subreddits for that kind of stuff. Quora is, out. Quora is good too. There's MDM reference docs. There's a lot of websites out there. Learn how to Google things to help you solve questions. Uh, there's no Google is like your friend. Very few web developers, or I should say any coding developers whatsoever, are going to be experts in anything. Everything's changing so fast. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. You don't know something. That, uh, just, that was the reality. Python changed a lot. JavaScript changed a lot in five years. Um, all these change a lot, so you're always going to not kind of know something. New things happen all the time. It's fine. Always get used to asking questions. If you don't know, just copy paste things. Everybody copy paste things. You can copy paste things too. It's fine. So it's on the web, and uh, it's you can copy paste it. If you're trying to use this part of like a project, eh, toss some love out there to people. And if you find it from a certain repo, uh, give credit to the repo. Give credit to the author. But if it's out there, people copy paste it. It's, it's fine. These are your two most common commands, control C and control V. Mm. Just get used to it. It's totally cool. Just don't stress out about it. Uh, and there's lots of great software out there by AC professionals. These are all developer people who have been working AC before. Layer app, test fit, high part, even forge from Autodesk is pretty heavily influenced by AC professionals and developers. And you know, if, if you want to level up, PyRevit's really awesome. A lot of people here already use Revit. PyRevit's an awesome tool to get started because you don't even know C sharp and the Revit API, which We've all, if, if anybody's tried both those things, it, you, you might get scared right away because it's, so, it's, it's a tidal wave. I read it by Esson, and he's been on this uh, Yoda thing before. Real cool stuff here. You could just start coding plugins for Revit with Python, which is a blessing. Pretty easy. He has a lot of uh, explanations on his website and user documentation um, supporting that. The user community is being built around this. HMC, my company, we've been using this too to do this because it's like, it takes forever to do like C sharp plugins. With the Revit SDK kit, which is like a huge, you have to be a developer to use that stuff. This is, you don't have to be a developer. You just have to be re ready to learn, to create your own tools. And another thing I recommend everybody try using if you're comfortable moving on for something else is Blender, the Blender BIM add in. Uh, that is, these are all open source, completely free. Blender is completely free. Uh, this is, you download it, you can create your own copies of all this stuff. They can do some cool stuff. I highly recommend checking this out if you're ready to do some coding, both in PyRev, either PyRev or Blender. Uh, because you can use these things to generate entire buildings in Blender with the Blender BIM add-in. So if you're like, you want to take your code to the next level, this is all Blender-based meshes being used to create a building. And I, I the Dion Molt that is true out there on open source tools uh, is um, working on this. Totally, you guys can grab it right now and install it. They're doing some great things to make it so you can do that kind of parametric modeling we're doing with Grasshopper and Dynamo is in Blender. I, it's very easy. It's a huge user community on Blender, so I highly recommend checking it out. And these are the kind of places you can, you know, apply yourself. Uh, it's a uh, uses IFC Open Shell. Uh, works with a lot of platforms. I, I think it works with Rhino, but definitely works with different BIM like ArchiCAD and Revit. Check it out. Let the link. OSR, great people. I highly recommend checking them out. And you know, meet up with your user teams. Uh, user groups like your desk, uh, AC Hackathon, Core Studio, Dynamo user groups. These are going to be great resources. I'm going to probably have to skip a few things, but I highly recommend track your progress. I always spend more than 0% of my time every day. Could be 30 seconds, could be two hours learning to code. Track your progress. You'll be surprised how far you get. That's why you have those GitHub green squares. Uh, just you know, keep it updated, keep it live. More than 0% of your effort every day goes far because you can easily skip three weeks. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of this stuff. Skip, I, I can't. We'll talk about this another day. But basically, at HMC, we created our own tools. We, we weren't experts, but we're with other companies, so we created our own tools uh, with open source. This is a bomb uh, system for you know creating. This is from a hackathon. I recommend everybody use a hackathon to learn better how to code. The more you code, the more you practice, the more you go to hackathons, the more people you'll meet that can supplement your knowledge. And uh, this is what we built. We didn't, you know, it was one person on our team, Brittany Holmes, doing this stuff. I wasn't involved, but um, this is what they made with Grasshopper scripts, Vue.js, um, the swarm from uh, Jordan Tom Sunny, bomb from 
through a Huffle. These are all open source projects coming together into this nice, cool system that tells you how much carbon is in your project. Built in two days. Nice. Get hackathons. Um, other stuff here, I'm not going to go into everything, but join groups, join hackathons. That's the best way to level up your skill. Uh, learn with these resources. A lot of these are actually free. YouTube's a great one. You Autodesk University if you're using web products and Autodesk products. And, you know, follow people. i got a nice list here. Again, I'll send this out so guys don't freak out and copy paste everything. I'll, I'll send this out later. And again, get out of your comfort zone. Try something you like. Uh, there's always something to learn. Go to groups, hackathons, self-paced learning. is always something. And just try something. Share with people. Share your code. Don't be afraid. Don't be bashful. I share things all the time. I, give, I pretty much have everything I would ever use. I give it away for free. I don't, it's not, if you're not getting subscription money on it, it's not worth anything. It's kind of obviously, it's not, you're not going to lose anything. It's fine. It's, it's free. Please share. That's how you learn and grow. People share it with me and I can learn and grow that way. That, these are my takeaways. Just get out of your comfort zone. Just try things and be consistent. And that's it. We have a few minutes for questions. I, there was a lot more I could have gone into, but I had to skip a bunch of things there to get to the point. But, it, but basically have a good coding setup. Keep that folder nice and clean. Nice little um, system for your folder. Depends what you want to do, but you can pick a very, very, very simple, like four files of the folder. Keep it consistent. Learn that Git flow. Get a nice text editor. Get those extensions. Learn those extensions. Just start learning the languages and coding away. It's it's going to be a discovery. Yes, it's going to be a discovery process, but I've asked questions from a million people. They've been pretty cool with different websites and person to person talks. They'll explain this to me. So don't be afraid that, you know, there's stuff missing here. There, there always is. You'll You'll figure it out. Yeah, that that was uh, incredible. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people pausing uh, and snapping screenshots um, yeah. from the recording. There, you went through a lot of stuff. That was fantastic. That was great. Uh, looks like we have uh, one more question. Uh, are you guys exploring Blender BIM at HMC? Are you looking into that or not yet? Uh, because we're still in the, the the just we have so many other things to do that that'll be down the road. But IFC, let's say it's something like IFC uh, Industry Foundation classes was an open source. Um, and open source tools in AEC design in general is the way to go in the future. Blender is open source as a software platform. Blender BIM is open source. IFC is open source. Um, more and more things are open source these days. Uh, Dynamo, Grasshopper, those are open source projects. You can create your own copy of those. So more and more things these days are open source. I, I will. I want to explore more into that myself because I think the whole industry is moving to open source projects and having so many... Um, uh, I forgot the word is um, proprietary systems like Revit's a proprietary system, Rhino's proprietary, you have to pay for them, and you can't do whatever you want with them. Part of that's just reality of anything. Adobe has a proprietary system, Microsoft has a proprietary system, but the, everybody wants to move towards just, I want to facilitate data and geometry. What can you do for me to make that easier? And these, com these companies don't want to miss the boat on that. So I highly recommend everybody to check out ISC and Blender BIM. We're going to look at that eventually, but it's not on our roadmap yet as a company. Because we have so many other things we want to work on with just Revit, Rhino, and the tools in between those two, and, and data in general. But I, that's something we're definitely interested in because this whole industry is going towards eventually, sooner or later, we're laggards open source. So I uh, highly recommend anybody who's interested in trying it out. I like what I see. It's, it's getting nice community support, and it's definitely the trend in our world. Yeah. All right. Well, I think with that, we're, we're right at the time. So... Um, Tade, thank you so much for, for sharing all of this information. And um, yeah, we will uh, we will post this as well in the Slack group and, and find a way to get this out there as well. So uh, yep, and you can see in the chat, um, Tade is posting his, his uh, Twitter information as well. So yeah, thank you so much. This was really fantastic.